Can you hear me? I'm sorry, I have a very low voice. Well, the mic doesn't know. I've got the same problem as Jacob. Okay. Well, if you uh, take a deep breath, you will probably smell the aroma of curiosity in this room. And that, of course, leads to excitement and anticipation, very much like what I imagine Eve must have felt like in the Garden of Eden just before she bit into the uh, fruit of knowledge. My name is Eva Goldfinger, and I'm the director of the Canadian section of the International Institute in Toronto. And along with my colleague, Karen Levy, I'm a rabbi at uh, Arena Congregation in Toronto. And it's so nice to see so many people who have Toronto connections here. You can see them clapping there. Well, the Hebrew word yichus refers to your lineage or your pedigree. It tells people where you come from. Now, in the Hasidic Yiddish-speaking environment in which I was raised, the word yichus was used like a badge of honor. It showed that you had value and worth because you came from a long line of noble and illustrious ancestors. Well, I learned very early that is, it's not the connections from which you come, but the connections that you make with the people around you throughout your life that count or that make a difference. And I learned that illustrious people are not those, or not specifically those who shine, but those who elucidate, who illuminate, and who illustrate the murky who bring intellectual and spiritual clarity and enlightenment to others. Professor Yehuda Bauer is precisely such an illustrious man. I met him about 22 years ago in this very room, and I consider myself extremely fortunate to have studied with him, not only in this type of large environment, but in a room with five people or six people on the road to my rabbinate. He has elucidated for me and for many of us in this room and many others many troublesome issues around modern Jewish history, the Holocaust, and anti-Semitism. But he also taught us beautiful Israeli songs while accompanying himself on the guitar. He told marvelous stories of his life, his travels, and his passions. And most importantly, he modeled for us what it means to be a real mensch. Yehuda, the very first time I took a course with you, I remember you telling us a story that I still remember. And because I am not perfect, I just try to live up to what you taught us. You told us that, um, and it's very relevant to the topic today, that your beloved father once told you that when you're in dialogue with somebody else, whose position is profoundly different from your own, what you do is you listen very respectfully, you do not interrupt, you certainly do not argue, because that just induces the person to come up with 23 more arguments to entrench himself in his own position. But when this person is finished speaking, you very simply and very firmly say, I completely disagree with your position and then quickly walk away. <laughs> this is incredibly irritating to that person because they can't argue the points that you were going to make. And that makes them think about the possible points that you would have made to argue their position and that's your only chance ever of influencing their opinion. Remember telling us that story? More or less. Okay. Now, when we raised the topic of Israel and the Palestinians, Yehuda clarified his position this way. He said, there are doves and there are hawks. I'm a goose. <laughs> I'm a peacenik, not a pacifist, and will always stand up and fight for what I believe in and what I believe to be right and just. That's almost a direct quotation. Well, friends, colleagues, and fellow learners. We are privileged today to have Professor Yehuda Bauer enlighten us on anti-Semitism as it relates to Muslim-Jewish relations. 
What qualifies him to do so? Well, he is one of the world's preeminent Holocaust scholars and has taught on the subject at Hebrew University, at Brandeis, Yale, and lots of others, and published nine important books on the Holocaust and anti-Semitism. Is that correct, nine? How many? 13. 13, okay, because your list only came up with now. We have to update the CV I had. 13. <laughs> Professor Bauer was the founding editor of the Journal for Holocaust and Genocide Studies and served on Yad Vashem's editorial board for its Encyclop Encyclopedia of the Holocaust. <laughs> Now in 1998, he was the recipient of the Israel Prize, which is the highest civilian award in Israel. And in 2001, he was elected a member of the Israeli Academy of Science. Today, he continues to serve as academic advisor to Yad Vashem and the International Task Force for Holocaust Education, Remembering and Research. Professor Bauer is also senior advisor to the Swedish government on the International Forum on Genocide Prevention. Not only is he a scholar in the field, but as a resident of Israel since 1939, he lives, eats, and breathes the issues surrounding Muslim, Jewish, and Arab Jewish relationships. Please help me welcome you, Huda Bauer, and be prepared to be enlightened. <laughs> Thank you very much, Eva. Uh, I've done this shtick here before, but um, you will hear me. Uh, but uh, um, it's a bit warm in here, so you all know that I have a jacket, so I can take it. Uh, when Shervin asked me uh, almost a year ago, uh, to participate in this colloquium on this topic, I said, I'm not an expert on Islam, but I'm not an expert on the Muslim world. I uh, deal with anti-Semitism, yes. Well, that's exactly what I want you to do, he said. <laughs> All right, uh, I provided my superior authority agrees. He sort of trembled for a moment. What do you mean by your superior? I meant, I meant my wife. Uh, and uh, once that agreement was, uh, was agreed upon, uh, I said, look, but I'm not going to prepare a paper. And he said, but you are going to prepare a paper because that's what we need. And I said, all right then, I'll prepare a paper, but I won't read it. <laughs> I'll speak freely. So I wrote a paper and I sent it to him, a first version, and uh, he said, okay. I said, I will play around with it. And then the tragedy in Morocco happened, and I sent the corrected paper to Adam. And it should be somewhere with well, him. There are copies on the table outside. So uh, anyone who wants to, who has nothing else to do and is sick and tired of looking at American football uh, <laughs> can read the paper instead. I do not, I am not going to repeat everything that's in the paper, quite the contrary, only some points and I will uh, talk about things that are not in the paper, which is uh, the way I think this should be handled. Now, you see, I am a historian, so I th think in terms of context. The context of Muslim anti-Semitism is Muslim-Jewish relations. In other words, how do these two entities relate to each other historically and as this paper is an exercise in political science, really, how does this work out today? And when I come to think about the term Muslim-Jewish relations, I ask myself a number of questions. You know, there are 1.3 billion Muslims in the world, and there are 13 million Jews, roughly, and their number is declining. 
So it's a relationship of a hundred to one. So it's a relationship between an elephant and a squirrel. <laughs> now the fact that the elephant thinks that the squirrel is an elephant doesn't make any difference. <laughs> it's still a squirrel. <laughs> so what do you mean relations? Can you have a relationship between an elephant and a squirrel? Well, maybe, but it's a problematic relationship before you ever start thinking about it. And the second thing is a question of equivalence. Because you see, when I think of Islam, uh, it is a religion, it's a universal religion. It's a huge force in the world. It always has been since its, uh, since in the, its inception. The Jews are not a religion. The Jews are an ethnicity that has had a religion. And there was an identity between religion and ethnicity until about 200 years ago. But anyone who joined the religion became part of the ethnicity. He, not she. Because overwhelmingly, Judaism, like Christianity and Islam, is anti-feminist. So it's Abraham, the son of Abraham, became a, an heir to the Jewish ethnic tradition. Now, can you compare religion with an, with an ethnicity? It's very difficult. And I'm not sure that this comparison or this, this, this terminology works. And when I say I'm not sure, I don't mean to say no. I mean to say that this is something to think about. And then you see, there's another problem of equivalence. It is quite clear to me, probably to you as well, that radical Islam, and I'll come back to that of course, is a genocidal movement. And it proposes the extermination of the Jewish people. The Jewish people. And it is, of course, clothed in theological argumentation. Now, there are Jewish fascists. And in Israel, we have a proportion of the population. I don't want to put any percentage to it, but one-fifth, maybe more, who are in favor of ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians. Not from the state of Israel, but from the whole of Palestine. Where do they want to put them? Well, there are some brilliant ideas. Some say Jordan, After all, you know. They can be Jordanian citizens, maybe. Does Jordan want that? Do they want it? Who cares? They... Or to the sign, I have to tell you a, a wonderful experience I had uh, when was it? Uh, pretty exactly two years ago at one of these Herzliya uh, meetings that deal with uh, security and politics, very important meetings. And there, a person who was then a minister in the Israeli government, one of these ideo uh, uh, religious ideological nationalists, uh, said quite clearly, we should uh, resettle. Sounded a bit, you know, I heard that word resettle. Uh, the Palestinians in the Sinai. And he forgot that the Egyptian chargé d'affaires was sitting in front of him. <laughs> and when he was done, the Egyptian stood up and said, please remember that Sinai is Egyptian territory. Now, he didn't put it the way I'm going to put it now, but that's what he meant. He said, mind your own bloody business. So there are people like that, and plenty of them. But even the most radical Israeli fascist will not uh, accuse or will not make propaganda against Islam. It's a nationalist thing. Palestinians. And these people are very egalitarian. They want to expel both Muslims and Christians. 
doesn't make any difference to them. They are Palestinian. So it's one-sided, you see. The Jews who can rightfully be accused of being, from my point of view, purely personal point of view, on the wrong side of the fence, will not attack Islam. But the Muslims, the radical ones, will attack the Jews. The equivalence there doesn't work. And to have a dialogue, you have to have a common basis. Now, in this particular situation, that common basis has to be created. It is not naturally there, I think. Now, again, context. When I talk about Muslim anti-Semitism today, and this is what I, I want to deal with, before I ask where it comes from, I have to say what the context is in which it appears. And I think the context has to be radical Islam as such, the ideology. Now for that, with all due respect, you don't have to know Arabic. I have some Arabic, it doesn't count. Because everything is translated. After all, we deal in the 20, end of the 20th, beginning of the 21st century. So the material is there. It is very simple, really, to find out what the radical Muslims want. But that doesn't tell us who they are. Because radical Islam is a diffuse ideology. It is not a hardened thing. It is not Marxist-Leninism. I mean, in Marxist-Leninism, you had St. Marx, St. Engels, St. Lenin, St. Stalin. Okay? Whatever they said, went. Stalin Skazal, he said, that was enough. You don't have that kind of thing among in radical Islam. Al-Qaeda, as we've, we were told here quite rightly, is really in numbers a marginal phenomenon. But there are large numbers of people who identify with parts or the whole of this ideology. Now what does that, what does that ideology say? I think that what it says is that they want to conquer the world because their main enemy, the West, is decadent, is weakening, and can be overthrown. When they talk about the reconquest of Spain, which is one of the items on the agenda, Andalus, in their language, they're really talking about reversing the victory of the French King, Franconian king, Karl the Hammer, Charles the Hammer, in 728 at Turin Poitiers against the invading army of Muslims from Spain, thus uh, preventing them from conquering Christian Europe. To reverse that, and I have seen, I've read radical Muslim statements that very cleverly analyze the situation in Europe. And you know, it's not that crazy at all. Because the, the West is weakening, and it is decadent. The time of the American superpower, in case you don't know, is over. America is no longer the only superpower. Mr. Bush has contributed to that. <laughs> but even without him, this is a phenom phenomenon, namely the American power, which started somewhere in World War I and is over at the beginning of the 21st century. We are facing a multiple wor world of powers, big ones, medium ones, First and foremost, of course, China, which used to be communist and is no longer. I mean, nobody has read Karl Marx there for years. It's a, an imperial power of tremendous importance, a tremendous population, 
with interaction with other powers. Increasingly, China controls Africa, and China is an ally of the Sudan, which is a militant Islamic regime, because they found oil, and because China depends on its survival, literally, on sources of energy, oil, natural gas, and also rare minerals. And so they have turned the Sudan actually into a Chinese vassal. They have penetrated Angola, Equatorial Guinea, the Central African Republic, and various other countries in different, to different degrees. There are tens of thousands of Chinese engineers, workers, and so on. You don't have to conquer a country anymore. You can do it by other means. They have turned Myanmar, Burma, into a Chinese vassal, although there they, there's a competition between them and the Indians and the Thais. But it's China that calls the shots. It's just an example. So we are living in a different world. And in that world, with a declining West, the radical Muslims have a chance. So they think. And I don't think they are absolutely crazy. And you know, Europe is undergoing a demographic catastrophe. In another 10, 20 years, there will be less Russians and Germans and Poles and Italians and Spaniards and British and so on and so forth. Because of a decline in the birth rate which parallels the situation in the late Roman Empire. And so what you have there is the possibility of a takeover, not by force. Because when, as these Europeans grow older, they have to have somebody to work for them. And that somebody will come from what they call incorrectly developing countries, because some of these countries are not developing. And therefore, people run, whether they come from Senegal or from Pakistan or wherever they come from. And most of them are Muslims, although from different places that don't talk to each other. You, you won't catch a, catch a Turkish person in Germany go into a Kurdish mosque. And they have different traditions. <coughs> Ethnically, they are different. They have the same religion or the same general image of a religion. Complicated stuff. And for the radical Muslims, there is a chance to penetrate there and to take over in time. At the moment, they are a small minority. They are growing. Because the Europeans have failed to integrate them. Compare that with your own country here where the integration of Muslim immigrants is much further advanced than in Europe, because you have a different tradition here. You are capable of absorbing, in time, with tremendous pain and trouble and so on and so forth, the Hispanics who prevent you from seeing that your demographic picture is the same as in Europe, except that you have massive immigration from the South, which covers up the situation. So the United States will probably become an Hispano-Afro-American nation, but with a, a continuing tradition, hopefully. And therefore, it is capable of absorbing group, groups like it absorbed the Jews, and it is absorbing the Muslims. But that is not the case in Europe. Now, conquer the world, is not something new. The Nazis tried it, and the Soviet communists tried it. There's a parallel there. And I'm reminded of the, con of the connection, because Haj Amin al-Husseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem, who was a Nazi, who came to Berlin because he wanted to identify with a project, with a program of the National Socialist Party in Germany, and he said so. And he recruited a Muslim division 
in the Balkans to fight alongside the German army, a Muslim SS division no less. He met with Adolf Hitler on the 28th of November 1941, and it so happens that at this particular meeting there was a stenographer. Not always happened with Hitler. And so we know exactly what was said. But at one point in the discussion, because, of course, they couldn't converse in the same language, so there was a translator, and he wrote down. Hitler said, when we win the war, this is November 41, when we win the war, we will turn to all the countries in the world to treat the Jews like we are treating them here. And the Mufti of Jerusalem was very, very grateful. Now, was the Mufti of Jerusalem a radical Muslim? I don't know. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Because he may have been typical of a certain type of transitional position between radical Islam and what is inaccurately and very difficult to describe uh, uh, mainstream Islam. The second thing that the uh, radical Muslims argue for is uh, the abandonment of any way to popular participation in uh, rule, in, in government. And the reason that is adduced is very simple. God, through the Quran, through the Hadith, through the Sharia, through the interpretations and all the rest of it, has already given us laws. If you elect somebody to make laws, that's not only heresy, that's blasphemy. So democracy isn't bad because of this, that and the other, but because it is blasphemy. So it's a question of principle, not a question of adjustment. There's a difference there between the Sunni type of radical Islam and the Shia type of radical Islam. But the Sunni type is very clear on that. The third point is really an anti-nationalist stance. Because what these people want is not ethnic national states. They turn against them. And they want instead of that Islamic states that will be part of a kind of, it's not worked out, it's not clear, kind of a, 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 an overall Islamic uh, government and, of course, the people who will uh, rule will be the clerics with uh, advisory groups called the shura. Now, this kind of a, uh, an attitude to nationalism you find in a different form with Nazism and communism as well. Because the National Socialists, really, wherever they ruled, were subjecting the local governments or the local states to a, uh, let us say, uh, a stage of being uh, submissive or um, looking up to Berlin for guidance. No independence, no national independence. And of course the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, uh, we know very well what the attitude was towards Ukrainians or uh, Turkmens or Uzbeks or whoever it was. And then, of course, the attitude in the people's democracies to the various countries of Eastern Europe. So you have a clearly anti-national, anti-nationalist, if you like, position. Now, who is the enemy? The enemy in their eyes is first and foremost Muslims who don't agree with them. It is the internal heretic traitor, the kufr, the, 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 the person who, who, who commits heresy within Islam, who is the target, and the corrupt governments that rule most of the Muslim countries. And I say Muslim, not necessarily Arab. They turn against them, and they want to replace them with Islamic government. 
There's only, at the moment, two places where radical Muslims rule. And that's the Sudan on the one hand, and Hamastan, the Gaza Strip, on the other hand. But they are quite different from each other, and they are different from other versions of radical Islam. So again, one has to be careful not to put everything into the same bag. There is a common ideology, but there is no center that directs what should be done. <clears throat> now, the next uh, enemy is the West and its spearhead, the Jews. Increasingly, despite all the warnings from various sides within radical Islam, they abandon the term Zionists. They talk about Jews. So you all are included in that. I don't want to bother you with quotes too much, but uh, on the question of democracy, we want to act according to the law sent down by Allah, and then no one, not the people, not the MPs, and not the ruler, will have the right to legislate laws. We want to implement the law of Allah regarding the one who abandons his religion. Murtad, the adulterer, the thief, the wine drinker. We want to require the woman to, to wear a veil, to act modestly, to prevent her from adorning herself. We want to prevent obscenity, corruption, adultery, sodomy, and other abominations. They, we will act against the religion of democracy and its freedom. I think it's fairly clear, isn't it? Uh, again, when Sheikh Mustafa bin Said Aitim, these are sheikhs and imams who are nominated by the Saudi government that is fighting Al-Qaeda. And this man in a mosque in Mecca says, the Jews have made, uh, no, the, the Muslim nation has made the offspring of apes and pigs, that's the Jews, its stars. The hangers on of the apes and pigs have become the centers of influence and power in the Muslim world. The Jews, Christians, and the hypocrites gnaw away at the body of the nation and carry out raids on it with the knights of the destructive media and with a deadly weapon of globalization. And then the Imam of Al Haram Mosque in Mecca, one of the most important uh, mosques in, in, in the Muslim world, Sheikh Abdurrahman al Sudais, says, Read history and you will understand that the Jews of yesterday are the evil forefathers of the even more evil Jews of today. Infidels, falsifiers of words, calf worshippers, prophet murderers, deniers of prophecies, the scum of the human race, accursed by Allah, who turned them into, the, into apes and pigs. These are the Jews, an ongoing continuum of deceit, obstinacy, licentiousness, evil, and corruption. And then he continues to say that they are in conflict with the Jews. <laughs> Surprise, isn't it? Uh, I think I should stop. You've got, you, you got the idea. I've got here a whole list of things. No, no, I think uh, you got the idea. And uh, uh, there's plenty of translations into English of all that stuff. You can find it on the internet, no problem. See, when I think of that, this is now over 60 years after the Holocaust. It's the same language. We are faced as Jews for the first time since 1945 with an open, clear, and decisive genocidal threat. And my colleagues, politicians, and so on, deal with European anti-Semitism. It's like, you know, 
dealing with a, I come from Israel after all, with a scorpion in front of you and there's a huge fellow with a big stick behind you ready to pounce on you. And you deal with a scorpion. A scorpion is very unpleasant, very dangerous. The fellow behind you is much more so. And I think one should remember very carefully these questions of the parallels. In the last hundred years or so, we have been witness to three genocidal ideologies that try to conquer the world. National Socialism, Soviet Communism, and Radical Islam. And Radical Islam, I want to say immediately, is not Islam. It's a mutation of Islam, just like Chabad is a mutation of Judaism. <laughs> no, I'm saying it quite seriously because the Rebbe of Chabad said that the Holocaust was a good thing. And uh, the Aryan nations is a mutation of Christianity. Except that, fortunately, Jews are not powerful enough to do much harm to the world. If they had the power, there might be a problem. And Christianity has declined to the point that the Aryan nations have become a marginal phenomenon. But not so with a tremendous movement. I can't estimate its size because it's so diffuse that penetrates into a huge part of humanity. About 1.3 billion out of 6.5 billion humans. That's quite a number. The vast majority of them are not radical Muslims. You are over huge, overwhelming majority. But that cancer is spreading. Now, where are the parallels? You see, national socialism, communism, and radical Islam were born more or less in the same decade. The first statement of Adolf, the first political statement of Adolf Hitler is from September 1919. The October Revolution occurred in 1917. And Hassan al-Banna founded the Muslim Brotherhood, which is metamorphosis, founded the Muslim Brotherhood, which was the fountainhead of this movement in 1928 in Egypt. By the way, the first public demonstration was against the Jews. It comes from the same background, these three movements from a deep crisis in, in Christian modern society. This crisis of modernization of a technological revolution that was much too quick, much too fast to be absorbed, of a quick changeover of political systems, of a tremendous advance in military technology, and a, a lack of direction because of all this confusion where exactly to take it. And the response with many was desperation, frustration, that sought an outlet to replace something that was not good with a utopia. Radical Islam proposes a utopia, just like Nazism did, just like Soviet communism did. And I repeat something I said here many years ago with an apology to Lord Acton. All utopias kill. All radical utopias kill radically. All universal utopias kill universally. And that really is what combines these three things with all the differences between them. The parallel between these three, these three uh, genocidal ideologies are based on religion. I already mentioned St. Mark's and St. Angels. The, the uh, Manchester manufacturer exploiting his workers 
in a sweatshop factory in Manchester in order to pay for writing of Das Kapital by his friend Karl Marx. And of course, Hitler's Mein Kampf, which people didn't read but quoted from. It's written in a German which is impossible to read anyway. And so all you need is quotes. And anyone who opposed it was a heretic. Ex to be excluded or to be dealt with much worse than exclusion. These three movements are based on religion. Two of them without a god, one of them with a god. Systems of belief. And there you have the problem, the major problem. Now, uh, I said radical Islam was not Islam. So what is Islam? Well, we've heard what Islam is. It's a complicated religious movement with a history and a uh, theology, a developing theology. You can interpret it in different ways. When uh, my good friend and uh, orthodox uh, theologian, Blue G Greenberg, many of you know her name, was asked by one of her Christian colleagues, what shall we do about the Gospel of John with its anti-Jewish statements? She answered, she answered, did what we did with impossible passages in our sacred books sometimes. We reinterpreted them to mean the opposite of what they said. <laughs> Reinterpretation is the name of the game. And so when you have people in Muslim past, but also in the present, trying to reform Islam, that means not reform it. You don't change sacred texts if you believe in, in religion. You reinterpret them. Now, it may be the case that we have actually the two extremes. Radical Islam in its different forms and reform Islam, which is a much smaller minority amongst Muslims. But it too is growing. And in the middle, the vast majority who waver. And people like the ones I quoted from and that I could have quoted from, are somewhere in the middle. And the, the lack of direction of where they should go comes up again and again and again. There is, for instance, that really important Muslim theologian uh, at Al Azhar University in Cairo, Tantawi. Now, Tantawi signed a declaration together with rabbis and churchmen uh, arguing for a dialogue or trialogue and arguing against suicide bombings. Wonderful, isn't it? That was in Alexandria in uh, January 2005. <coughs> and then he went back to Cairo. There was a demonstration against him by his students. And he said, no, I didn't mean that. He retracted his signature. He wrote his PhD in 1966 in a book against the Jews, which was published a year later. And that, that's an example. There are, there are people like that. They are brilliant. They are, they are, they've got tremendous knowledge and intelligence and so on. Who then are the most extreme extremists? Well, we know their names. They write even when they write under pseudonyms in, 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 in various websites which change their names occasionally and so on, it is fairly clear who is behind those names. Uh, they, are, they come usually from quite well-to-do families. That's the norm. Many of them are Egyptians. The person who developed <coughs> radical Muslim ideology including its anti-Semitism more than anyone else at the beginning, was an Egyptian official by the name of Said Qutb, who uh, 
spent some time in the United States and came back convinced that the West was dying and the time had come for Islam to take over. Islam in his interpretation. Was Kutub and his colleagues fundamentalists? Because this was used here, and I think wrongly. Because radical Islam surely is fundamentalist, but it goes far beyond fundamentalism. What is fundamentalism? We ought to be rather clear about the terms that we use. And when we are unsure, we, we should say that we are unsure. Fundamentalism is a very clear notion. It's a, an American Protestant idea. It was brought over from England in the 1820s by an itinerant preacher, English preacher by the name of William Danby, who asked, quite successfully, American Protestants to return to fundamentals, by which he meant a literal interpretation, first of all of the New Testament, but of the whole Bible, Old and New Testament alike. Literal interpretation in the most radical sense possible. And he provided examples. So fundamentalism is an American concept. It comes from Christianity. And if you mean by it, a literal interpretation of a religious heritage, of whatever holy scriptures you believe in, then Jews are no less fundamentalist than Muslims, and Christians are no less fundamentalist than Jews. The Catholic Church, not exactly known for its love of Protestantism, declares to this very day, extra ecclesiam non est salus, there is no salvation outside of the church. And in Protestant Christianity, if you don't believe in your personal Savior, Jesus Christ, you will roast in hell. Because you see, all these monotheisms are ultimately not monotheistic at all. In Judaism, not only the origin of Judaism, which has had a god and a goddess, Yehovah and the Asherah, as Yaakov told, to, taught me, the Asherah stood, the, the statue of the Asherah stood in the holiest of holies of the Jerusalem temple for what? 150 years or so. She was the wife of Jehovah. So we start from polytheism. But even after that, there is Satan, right? In Job, okay? So you have a negative God, and then later on you have the Shekhinah, the spirit of God, it's Trinity. That's monotheistic Judaism. I don't have to tell you about Christianity. With its Trinity, but there's more than that. They are sort of in between gods, you know, various angels and saints and so on and so forth. And Islam? Come on. There is Satan there too. And the prophet is taught by archangels. Sort of in between. There is no such thing as monotheism. So, in this kind of an atmosphere, you've got to be very careful you see, when you look from these theories into the practical world of today. And in the practical world of today, there is that threat against the Jews. They are the spearhead. They are the descendants of apes and pigs, and sometimes they are apes and pigs themselves. They are deceitful, they are licentious, and so on and so forth. And that, as has been said here before quite rightly, is a combination of some anti-Jewish statements in the classical uh, development of Islam, plus a great deal of European anti-Semitism that was absorbed quite literally in its expressions uh, by uh, radical Muslims today. How far is the Israeli-Palestinian confrontation part 
of this anti-Semitic thing. Certainly it is. I mean, what the Jews did was to come back to a country which in the meantime had become Muslim land. And there is no way that you can accept non-Muslim occupation of land that was once Muslim. Which is the reason why the next aim is of course the reconquest of Spain. That was Muslim country. So there is a very basic issue there. Fortunately, uh, not everyone interprets it that, that way. And uh, you have a, always a mixture of pragmatic and ideological elements in all these things. I was asked not so long ago whether I think that Israel should negotiate with Hamas. I said, why not? They don't recognize us. We don't recognize them. So let's talk. <laughs> they want to eliminate us. We would love to get rid of them. So let's talk. What about? Not about peaceful solutions. That's impossible. But about arrangements. We'll stop bombing you and you'll stop sending rockets against us. And if you, if we can arrive at kind of a pragmatic thing. But you know, the Jewish attitude is in a way Radical too. It's not fundamentalist. It's radical. It's, in my view, senseless. I mean, I'm no, I'm no pacifist. I think we should have a strong army. In our area, this is, in, this is inevitable. But uh, to use that army sparingly, and when we use it, not to make a mess of it like we did in, in, in last year in the Lebanon. And so, you see, I think that what we should be willing to do is to talk to anyone. Talk? Why not? Will anything come out of it? Who knows? Maybe yes, maybe no. It's better than shooting. But if it's necessary, then shoot. So, when you face this kind of an anti-Semitism, you've got to be flexible. You've got to realize that you are under a genocidal danger. And that brings me to my last point, and that is Iran. Because Shiite radicalism is different from Sunni radicalism in some aspects. I won't deal with that. But the pragmatic outcome of it is very clear. Whatever the problems that he faces inside his country, Mr. Ahmadinejad made a great impression on the world and has been quite successful in many of the things he did. Now I want to pick out the anti-Semitic part. It's not only that he threatens Israel with genocidal destruction. And it's not only that he denies the Holocaust. He made that conference, remember, last year in December in Tehran? And the whole Jewish world was up in arms. He wants to convince the West that the Holocaust didn't happen. He didn't. That's a mistake. If you read carefully what happened there, you find that a week before that conference, his great invited guest in Tehran was none other than the Prime Minister of the Hamas movement in the Gaza Strip, Mr. Haniyeh. Now, what does a Sunni radical do in, a, in the capital of uh, Shiite Islam? The Iranians want to have some kind of a contact with the Sunnis because ultimately the civil war that's going on in Iraq, it's no use to them. They want an arrangement that will leave them in power, of course, in overwhelming power, but these mutual killings are no good to them either. And so they are looking for allies. There is an alliance between Tehran, Beirut, and Gaza. There is a man, I 
can tell you his name. His name is Imad Burnia. And he sits in Tehran in the offices of the Revolutionary Guard and he is responsible for contacts with Hezbollah. And there's a Shura Council of Hezbollah sitting in Beirut, which meets, I'm told, every week, maybe wrong, maybe right. Uh, and there are always at least one or two Iranian representatives there from the embassies in Damascus or the mission in Beirut. And there's also usually a man there from the Hamas movement in the Gaza Strip, although those are Shias and those are Sunnis. Osman Hamdan is his name. Where do I get this from? Today, everybody can find out. <laughs> it's not very difficult. And you see, the intention of the meeting in Tehran was not towards the West. I mean, who cares about the West? It was in order to recruit Muslims on an issue that can be consensual, namely that the Jews lie, because they always do. The Holocaust never happened, that's quite clear. And all the Jews want is to penetrate into the Muslim world and destroy it from within. And so you have to convince the Muslims. Why? Again, second point, because Iran wants to control the Persian Gulf. And the Persian Gulf is populated, as we heard here, to a not in unimportant part by Shiites. And so you either overthrow these governments that are weak anyway, or else pull them on your, to your side, and then you can close the Persian Gulf to Western vessels if you want to. And you hold the West by the throat. And that is the purpose. And therefore the alliance now between Russia and Iran. Because the Russians want the same thing that the Iranians want. Now, where do we fit in into all that? We are a very small people. Now, the uh, uh, answer to the question I was asked by somebody <laughs> before we came in, are you going to give us some hope? And I said, not today, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> because the organizers of the colloquium told me to concentrate on anti-Semitism in the context that I described, and then gave me more time tomorrow to say what in my absolutely crazy illusions I think might be the answers. So I'm sending you home with a uh, very... Uh, uh, shall I say, uh, radical message. Don't sleep because you won't be able to sleep after that. <laughs> we are in a hole. We, the Jews, and together with us, many others, we are faced with a serious danger. We have to think very carefully how to get out of it, or how to limit it at least. And I can tell you a kind of a preview of tomorrow. The basic answer is we can't do that alone. The Jews are too weak to be able to defend themselves alone. Without the Jews, there will be no defense. But with the Jews only, there will be no defense either. And uh, I think that when you uh, think about it, and there are more contexts that I didn't touch here, then this is part of a globalized world. A world that, where you cannot deal with an issue in one place that doesn't affect another one. And we have to get rid of provincialism. Americans are typically provincial. You have to think globally. It's not just the economy that's globalized. It's the thinking that's globalized. It's the politics that's globalized. It's the dangers that are globalized. And my very last point is, 
even more pessimistic than that. You see, the, the human race began, nobody knows exactly, probably 200 to 500,000 years ago in East Africa. And th this we know because there are DNA probes that show it. Uh, we all come from the same place. Whether in the meantime we have become Australian Aborigines or Albert Einstein or you and I, we come from the same place. So there are no races. There is one human race. The differences between dogs are much greater than the differences between humans. But how long have we been here? Say half a million years. <laughs> the planet is four and a half billion years old. Half a million years, you know, that's nothing. The universe dies. The universe was not created. The universe developed. Birth and death, everything dies. Stars, the globe, this planet, humanity. Sooner or later, we will disappear. We are here because we would like to exist a little bit longer rather than be gone sooner. But we're going to go and with us will go all our problems and achievements and failures and gods and all that sort of stuff. But it's important to carry on because we can create something that will be, as Sherwin Wine put it so well, remembered by our descendants. This is what our basic biological drive is, that we should have a continuation. There is no immortality, there is no paradise, there is no hell, but there are children and grandchildren.